It's the Dearly Departed Podcast, featuring your host, historian Scott Michaels and filmmaker Mike Dorsey. All right, it's a, uh, another episode of Dearly Departed Podcast, and um, this one we're going to do on Greece. Greece is the word. <laughs> you know what I heard? I've heard, and now I don't know, I just read this today, that through the whole movie Greece, the word Greece is never said. Really? <laughs> I have to watch it again, and I, you know. But I, I know that the song "Grease Lightning," you know, that's that's a, that's that shows up. But as I understand it, the word "Grease" that uh, it never shows up a single time in the movie. You, you could probably get a copy of like the screenplay or a transcript and just do a search for the word "Grease," <laughs> which is much Save much yourself. easier than watching the whole movie again. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, all right. So it's daily to part of podcast, and I'm Mike Dorsey. I'm Scott Michaels. And uh, let's just get into like miscellaneous news and deaths and stuff. It's been a it's been a while, hasn't it? And there's a, there has been some uh, really fascinating, uh, a, a pretty impressive exits in the last couple of weeks. Seriously, yeah, a lot of newsworthy ones. Somebody uh, reminded us that you know we talked about in our Sunset Boulevard e- episode about the Bacoima Air mid-air collision disaster in 1957, mm-hmm. remember? And uh, someone mm-hmm. pointed out, we, we forgot to mention, that that high school, Pacoima Junior High, was Richie Valen's school. Of course. And he was, a, he was course. 15, so he's still a student there at the time. He was out that day. He was a grandparent's funeral. And that's okay. why he wasn't in any... In, 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 like, so, and, and three kids died, a bunch of others were severely injured yeah. in it. And yeah, he, he should have been there, but he wasn't. He was out that day. Richie Valen's an airplane... <laughs> Seriously. Not a good mix. <laughs> Seriously. No, for real. <laughs> wow. So I, that's, um, that's fascinating. Yeah. Oh, you know, our uh, I sent you this link. Our uh, Six Degrees of Helter Skelter documentary was just in an article on Screen Rant this week, uh, yesterday actually, and they ran, it was a ranking of the 10 best cult documentaries, and we came in number eight. Really? Yes. Cult documentaries. 10 best cult documentaries. Documentaries and what about were the other cults. ones? That's a good That's question. great. I mean, what is it? thank you to Screen Rant. I mean, what, <laughs> that's very typically L.A. <laughs> oh, who cares? We made the list. What are the other ones? <laughs> who, <what? laughs> who else did they talk about? <laughs> who cares? <laughs> um, number one was The Lost Women of Nixivum. N-X-I-V-M. I don't know that one. A Waco doc. Uh, Wild Wild Country is number three. That's a hell of a good documentary. Um, Prophet, Prophet's Prey was on there. My Scientology movie. It was a Jonestown one. It's an honor to be named with all these other great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> great I know what I watched recently was a, a documentary on the making of Galaxy Quest, and, uh, and that was really good. I am that in was the mi- really good. I just started watching Galaxy <laughs> Quest again this morning. Oh, funny is that? That's hilarious. That's, I'm like you know, 20 minutes Mike, honest to God, I had, I had to run the Rite Aid about an hour ago, and uh, you're the one that I want was on the, uh, no, Summer Nights was on the on really? plane. You know, I'm like, this is, there's a lot of chick, 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 chick things going on right now. Well, and there's a couple things that jumped out, because I haven't seen Galaxy, Galaxy Tw- Quest in probably 20 years, and I didn't realize Rain Wilson's in it, which I didn't realize. He's one of the aliens. And uh, Tim's house is the stall house oh, yeah, yeah, in yeah, the Hollywood yeah, yeah. Hills. And... Uh, an early thing where he shows up and they all decide to get on the ship and leave together. They're at this like grand opening for like an electronics store. It's yeah. the roof of the parking garage at the Peterson Automotive Museum. Is it? Yep. And you can see Was the that ma- in this documentary. You can, you can I didn't s- hear that. I don't know, but it's in. I, I know. I recognized it because we filmed up there uh-huh. uh, for Unsolved, and so I, I recognized it immediately. And you can see the gold of the May Company building in the background. You know, part Interesting. of it. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool! But they just—they put a sign up, you know, over the, the the doors there that lead onto the roof that says for an Which electronics is, store. Okay. Yeah. And isn't that like the uh, the la- that's where the biggie party was held? Wasn't yes, it? correct. Yep. All right. Okay. That's where the, huh. the party was held, where Biggie was that Biggie was killed leaving. Yeah, and that and this was filmed just two years after that happened, or the movie came out just two years later. So yeah. You can also wow. see that intersection where Biggie was killed in a scene from, uh, I believe, American History X. That's filmed at Johnny's across the street. Right. You can I haven't see seen that in a long time. You can see through the windows. And I think also um, a scene from uh, The Big Lebowski, you can see that intersection in the background. Yeah. That's the one, the Big Lebowski one, I think, because that was shot uh, around the same time as the murder happened. They were in production. 
because they, that movie was filmed in 97. Um, really? And the, and the filming production dates, Biggie's murder was in the middle of it somewhere. So when you watch that movie, I think it's the John Goodman scene where he talks about, I can get you a tow. You know, I can get you a tow from anywhere, you know? And, yes. and the yes. dude's telling them to, like, calm down. And he's like, I'm calmer than you are. And out through the windows, you can see the intersection of Wilshire and Fairfax where Biggie was shot. And that is what it looked like, you know, when, when that shooting would have happened. Because it would have been within a few weeks of the murder. So Did we, did we talk about that movie uh, with Anthony Edwards called Miracle Mile? I don't think so. Uh, I was talking, that was, it was this really weird movie from the 80s. It was great because the guy, he's eating at that diner, Johnny's, on, on the corner of Wilshire right. and Fairfax. And the payphone's ringing. And, uh, and, he, and Anthony Edwards is leaving. He just picks it up. And he's told that there's this nuclear bomb headed for Los Angeles and the entire you know, country is going to be uh, destroyed. And it turns out that there was a guy from like military intelligence that misdialed by one number. He was going to call his father. <laughs> and he got that, uh, got that payphone instead. And the whole movie is this hour and a half of him you know, trying to figure out what the hell they're going to do. It's it's really interesting. They do Pan Pacific Park before before it was torn down. Right. Uh, Farmer's Market, all around there. But it is a really wild, good movie. It's hmm. it's it's nobody has ever heard of it. But Miracle Mile is really good. And speaking of nuclear attacks, I just saw that uh, Jim Carrey. I think he was on Fallon this week, and he he was in Hawaii when they had that false alarm about the nuclear missiles from North Korea. Uh huh. He thought he was going to die, like everybody else did. And was like mm-hmm. basically trying to figure out what to do with the last minutes of his life, <laughs> and and then you know two minutes before Im- impact comedy gold yeah <laughs> comedy gold on Jimmy Fallon <laughs> how am I going to die <laughs> yeah uh, and then you know two minutes before it's supposed to hit is when they sent the all clear that it was a false alarm and all that stuff but yeah he just I think he said something along the lines of he didn't want to die in his car and he went and he was just looking out at the ocean basically and kind of life flashing before his eyes kind of a moment you know kind of reliving his life and then. And then it turned out it was false alarm. I can't see Jim Carrey calmly looking at the ocean and chilling. <laughs> that is not the Jim Carrey I am familiar with. <laughs> so, right, um, right. Well, that, that, that's got to be freaking scary. There's a couple of... Uh, I, I'm a sucker for those prank videos. I watch them all the time on uh, YouTube. You know, the guys with the Nutella in the bathroom. And, uh, uh-huh. uh, and you know, and there's, and there's one where they the guy has a... A recording of a nuclear bomb being launched, and, and his wife and he are supposedly watching it live, and she's just flipping out and screaming. It's it's, it's fascinating. <laughs> it's terrible. If anyone did that to me, I'd kill him. But it's very funny. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, it's hilarious. Uh, shall we do deaths of the week? Deaths of the week. News of the week. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, I, I, for me, number one has to be Carl Reiner, the uh, comedy TV legend, uh, Dick Van Dyke show, of course. Uh, I also directed The Jerk and Oh God and a number of other films and um, is kind of credited with helping uh, launch or, or uh, uh, popularize Steve Martin's film career in, in the early years. And uh, his wife, Estelle, delivered the famous line in When Harry Met Sally, uh, the I'll have what she's having line at the yeah, end of the movie. That was a gift. <laughs> a gift from Rob Reiner to his mother. That was, uh, that was pretty cool. <laughs> right. And, and uh, uh, that's such a hilarious scene. And then that perfect little you know, cap at the end of it with her line has just uh, elevated it. Elevated it. Um, yeah. Every night, Carl would have dinner with Mel Brooks, who he was good friends with for 70 years. Uh, they were both widowers. And every night, uh, Mel Brooks would go to Carl Reiner's house, and they would eat dinner, watch Jeopardy, and then watch a movie. And to be a fly on the wall for even <laughs> yeah, one of those kidding. nights. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. I wonder, I wonder if they, they spoke at all or if they just trashed what they were watching or uh, <laughs> or if they just, just intently watched. That would be really interesting. Because they, they both honestly, are really... You know, they're both elderly. They're both really old. I mean, you know, he's old. and uh, But completely there. All the sparks were, Mentally. you know. Yeah. It was because uh, he always showed up in documentaries, always, uh, in recent years. And uh, generous with his time. And, uh, and, uh, and, and a lot of people really respect him. A lot of people do. Right. I, I, want, I would love to just see what, like, what their movie list was. Like, what yeah. were they watching, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Anyways, so uh, thoughts, you know, it makes you think of Mel Brooks because now Mel Brooks is not only now, you know, a widower, but has also lost his best friend that he was, you know, would spend every evening with talking to. And, and uh, that, that old guard is dying off. 
Yeah, yeah, he probably lost all of his friends. That's got to be, yeah, that sucks. That's just, there's no good way to, you, <laughs> you know, yeah, you just, there's no one to go, hey, remember? Oh. Uh, Hey, you know, you don't. Oh. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's like, oh, there's yeah. that one time you were there. Oh, uh, yeah, that's It's sucks. definitely a, a special level of loneliness, I think, when nobody's around for you to tell the old stories with anymore that remember yeah. that can be like, you know, that was there. Uh, but uh, uh, Carl died on June 29th. He was 98. And one press report was that he died in his sleep. Uh, but his nephew, who's a, 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 a talent manager and TV producer in his own right, says that... Um, Carl passed away after dinner. It was 10 o'clock a night, and he was walking out of his living room or dining room area, and he was a staff person was helping him, and all of a sudden his knees buckled, and he kind of fell. And then he, he passed away not long after that. Uh, but his last meal was a hot dog from Pink's that was named after him called the Reiner Dog. And so they is, must have got uh, yeah, Postmates or something to the right. So, <laughs> yeah, maybe Mel brought it over. <laughs> apparently, a Reiner dog was a hot dog with mustard and sauerkraut, and then apparently he had it with a side of beans, and that was his favorite dinner. Was the Reiner dog? Sounds I don't know. delicious. If I had a hot dog <laughs> named after me at Pink's, I'd probably be my favorite meal too, though. You know, I don't think I'd do the mustard and sauerkraut necessarily, but no, no, Pink's. Yeah, Pink's is its own its own animal. <laughs> <laughs> um, then uh, uh, next up, uh, Charlie Daniels, the country music mm. legend, most famous for Devil Went Down to Georgia, passed away on July 6th at 83 from a hemorrhagic stroke. He was in the Country Music Hall of Fame, too. A, uh, I mean, I, I listened to Willie's Roadhouse all the time on Sirius, and that was like flags at half staff that day. A lot of people, oh, wow. uh, a lot of people really loved Charlie Daniels. And I'm not a country music guy, but Devil Went Down to Georgia is a damn good song. And I, it still gives me goosebumps, you know, when, when he talks about the devil and you hear that, that screech when they just uh, uh, rubs the, uh, I, I, what was it that made this, the the, uh, the guitar strings or something, the violin strings, he just scratched them. And it right. still gives me goosebumps. It was, uh, yeah, it was a good song, really great song. I love story songs. Country music mm -hmm. has great story songs. I mean, The Night the Lunch Went Down to Georgia, uh, Fancy, uh, you know, there's some great you know, story songs. I love that stuff. Right. Uh, Joel Schumacher, the famous director, uh, directed mm -hmm. The Lost Boys, St. Elmo Elmo's Fire, Flatliners, The Client, A Time to Kill, Falling Down, 8 Millimeter. And you look at that long list, uh, he was one of the best, you know, mo one of the most famous directors of the 80s and 90s, certainly. And I saw, like, multiple headlines that basically just pointed out that he directed a controversial Batman movie it's like because he did Batman and Robin with George Clooney and I'm like you really? look at that guy's whole career and that's what you focus your headline on was that he directed what's considered a very bad Batman movie huh. <laughs> that you know oh. George Clooney has spent the rest of his life apologizing for being in um, I even went to a screening of Argo when it came out that Clooney did a Q&A at the end of and I remember somebody in the audience asked him if he worried about his security for making this movie about Argo and Iran and everything. And his response was, no, have you seen Batman and Robin? He's, he's <laughs> like, if I survive that, if nobody killed me over that, I'm not worried about anything. So it's, it's become a punchline for him, that movie. Um, but I think it's a bummer because Schumacher was a really interesting guy, and he made some really kick-ass movies uh, throughout his career. And uh, did you read the interview he did with uh, Vulture last year? It was like almost a year ago. Exactly. He did a really amazing interview, and it was one of these, like, no shits left to give types of interviews, right? He was completely honest and blunt about everything, and it's it's really fascinating. Um, okay. But he, uh, anyways, he passed uh, away on was, June 20th. Was, was that, that in Vanity Fair or something? What was that in, do you know? Vulture, which oh, I think okay. Vulture Sorry. is New York Magazine. It's kind of a must-read, I think, if you're a fan of anything Hollywood-related. It's a really mm -hmm. fascinating interview with him. Uh, but he passed away on June 22nd. He was 80 from uh, cancer. Wow. So, what a life. Uh, started out as a costume designer and set designer and then moved into directing in the 70s. From, I didn't from there. know that. Yeah. Interesting. Um, that Falling Down movie is... I love that movie. That movie is so <laughs> so messed up. Right, so, and you kind of understand, you know, what makes somebody snap, and that was that is like that. That is, it's not L.A. isn't you know wasn't nearly as harsh back then as it is now, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, and you just cause somebody just to snap and walk out of their car on the freeway and just flip out, and uh, right. and just not. I, I love that movie. It's so it's so <laughs> so good. 
And it's one of those kind of batshit movies that you they, you, you talk about things that wouldn't get made today. I don't know that that would get made today. Mm. No, you're right. Hollywood just Absolutely Hollywood not. isn't in that place anymore. Yeah. 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 Especially from a major director like that. We're going to talk about in a minute uh, the show Glee, but mm -hmm. uh, that I mean, talk about shows that wouldn't get made anymore. This isn't that old. But anyway, we can talk about that when we get to it. But I just wanted yeah. to uh, to mention that. Uh, Kelly Preston. John Travolta's wife and a famous act, an accomplished actress in her own right. She was in Twins and Jerry Maguire, my personal favorite of hers. I thought she was amazing in Jerry Maguire uh, for Love of the Game. And um, she also, I just found out about this, she was in school at the same time uh, at Barack Obama's school in Hawaii at the same time that he was there. Oh, interesting. I don't know that they were the same age, but they were there at the same time, apparently. Now, does she, is she... Did she speak like Nicole Kidman? Like she was born in Hawaii, but spoke with an Australian accent. Cause that's where, accent, because that's where she was brought up. Was she like that? Did people just assume Kelly Preston was from Australia? I, I don't, don't know. remember. But I, don't I know, know that that's the thing with Nicole Kidman. I think they were all born in Hawaii and moved to Australia. Oh, and, interesting. Uh, and everyone just assumes they're Australians, but, uh, right. but they're not. Huh. Um, she passed away on July 12th, age 57, from breast cancer. And I think it was one of those uh, situations where they kind of kept it quiet that she was sick. Clearly, yeah. That was a real So it was surprise. a shock. It was a shock to yeah. people, I think, when she passed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and this one is kind of the big one in the news still today. Uh, Naya Rivera, uh, the right. Glee star, who passed yeah. away on uh, July 8th. At Lake Piru, California, she was 33, and really, kind of almost bizarre circumstances. She went out on a pontoon boat with her four-year-old son and drowned. And luckily, yeah. the four-year-old was okay. Um, but I saw you went out to the lake a couple days ago. Yeah. yeah. What, what was that like? Well, it was. It is sort of. It was like. It, 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 the lake looks like a beautiful lake. I never knew it was there. It's an hour north of LA, and you you drive through some really. Uh, you know, it's it's inland, but it's this beautiful lake, man-made lake, and I guess it's like 150 feet deep at some point. It's not that big, because you could sit on one end of it or stand and look, and you could see the whole thing. So it wasn't like they had to do a search for her, her for her boat. You could have you could have stood there at the dock mm -hmm. and go, oh, I think I see it over there, you know? Right. Um, but it was it's a beautiful place, but it's so the water's so deep, and there's so much underwater foliage. There's like tr entire trees down there, and mm -hmm. uh, and they say it's it's notorious for being a hazard. Uh, there have been eleven drownings there, and I don't know in how many years, but but uh, but they say that the underwater is is really hazardous. But you're right, hers is an interesting story because. You know, she went out for an hour-long uh, rent of the boat, and three hours later, you know, that she didn't come back, and somebody they went out and looked at the boat, and the kid was sleeping, and on the right. boat, and the, and uh, and she was nowhere to be seen. And then the kid said that uh, she put him out, picked him out. They were swimming. She picked him out of the water, put him on the boat, and then that's the last he saw. She disappeared under the water. He turned around so and saw her disappear under the surface. Yeah. yeah. So I don't, I can't really understand a whole lot of that because I, I don't know. It just seems like, well, first of all, you know, wear a life preserver, you know, a personal flotation device. I mean, that yeah. That apparently makes sense. the kid had apparently the kid had one on, but she didn't. Right, and I understand a mother. I, I think I understand that a mother would want to protect their child, but if the child had on a life vest, he was going to be fine. Now she mustered yeah. up the strength to put him up there it's it surprises a lot of people that she couldn't muster the strength to hang on to a, a, a step of the of the something you right. know i mean they didn't find her for five days so so th there's really no way we'll ever get an answer there's no closed circuit television on any of those boats or anything like that but uh yeah it just, and they didn't find questions. her like they didn't find her like hung up on a tree underwater or any where you could tell oh i see what happened they just have to yeah all they can do is speculate and apparently like you said it was a very dangerous lake locals have been trying to get uh signs posted for years warning people not to swim there are the signs lake. posted saying don't swim there? that's oh, really? the yeah, okay. they're well, there <laughs> there you go maybe they put them up after this happened i don't know but i had read that the locals have been trying because it's so dangerous with the trees yeah. and there's rip currents those currents are really bad in the lake and and if you get hung up on something and there's a current that's when that's when you get pulled under that's why mm -hmm. they always say if you fall off a boat in a river, don't try to stand up. Because if your foot gets caught on something, the current is going to push you down and hold you on. And, and the boat wasn't anchored either. So the boat right. was going with the wind. It, it that's drifted. why it blew to the north end of the lake. So, so yeah, mm -hmm. that's another thing. She, she may have freaked out because the boat was getting too far. 
and you know she wanted to get to the boat with her kid and put the kid on there but uh, it just it, there is that why didn't she grab onto something you know it's if she had that it's 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 really sad and there there is some really beautiful memorials of people left up there but this, I don't know, for some reason it really this one really I don't I don't know it's it's a testament to their acting because this woman I really liked her character on the show well, she was really good she had a great voice she danced well and she was she was a good actress I don't know so it's it's, uh, it's sad to see somebody that young you know in a, in a I don't know it's such a bizarre circumstance yeah, the the story didn't sit right with me at first, and I guess the more I learned, the more I buy. Okay, I guess it was just an accident, but I mean, not that I think foul play happened because you know they have video of her and her son going, you know, parking in the parking yeah. lot and walking, and you showed it in your video on YouTube. And they, you know, you see them getting on the boat and then motoring away together. Nobody else is with them, um, yeah. but I just the whole thing is a little. That's a little strange, but maybe that was normal for her to go up there with her son and do stuff like that. I don't know. She oh, she grew up twenty miles from there, so that was on so her radar. The, like, you know, she probably yeah. And yeah. uh, and she and you know what else? There's there's a lot of because she's the third major cast member from that show that died uh, in their thirties. Right. Major cast members, and but she you know because there's been a lot of flack about uh, the other one, uh, Leah Michelle, and a lot of, there's been a lot of cancel culture kind of stuff going after her. But everything I've looked about Naya Rivera, it doesn't seem. It seems like she's kept her nose pretty clean. Uh, she's never come out and said, you know trashed anybody. I don't think she's any done, never done anything any really embarrassing at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so which is even even more sort of uh, I don't know I don't know I don't know where I'm going with that. But it, it's sad. It really made <laughs> me sad. Very sad. And these things usually don't uh, touch me that way, but it did. Right. And and speaking of the other cast members, she it took them six days to find her body. Mm -hmm. And she was found on the seven-year anniversary of the death of Corey Montieth from the show, who mm -hmm. overdosed. So that a lot of people thought that was an interesting coincidence that it was right on and the seven-year yeah. anniversary. And her old boyfriend was that was Puck that wanted to kill himself for child porn. Uh, uh, she was with him for like two years. Uh, uh, Mark Selling. Oh, so she wow. was with Mark Selling uh, for two years, and then he got busted for child porn, and then hanged himself. So she, yeah. you know, it's interesting, uh, fascinating. She said, but she said about Saling is that I wasn't completely surprised about what happened, but I was shocked by what he did as, as far as the suicide went. But uh, the other thing wasn't a total surprise or shock. Huh. Uh, next up, another shocking and bizarre one uh, to some extent, uh, Steve Bing. The wealthy yeah. uh, politi political activist and film financier, uh, he... Uh, um, Financed uh, Get Carter and Rock the Casbah and the Polar Express, which is probably his biggest success of his films. Uh, he 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 financed Scorsese's uh, Rolling Stones documentary Shine a Light. Uh, he was very politically collect connected. He he was one of those guys who kind of knew everybody, kind of a dude. Um, some ties to Epstein and Clinton, and um, he jumped off his twenty seventh floor balcony of a Century City apartment. And killed and committed suicide. And uh, I don't know if the note was left behind. It kind of sounds like there wasn't because they're just kind of stuck speculating about what drove him over. You know, what a shitty thing to do to people on the street. You know, I'm really sorry mm -hmm. you're having a shitty life. I'm sorry you want to end it. But what, that is really fucked up. What if, what if somebody's just walking by and now they got to deal with that for the rest of their life? You know, that like, image. it's just such a so selfish. Uh, I'm sorry, you know. I mean, I'm 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 sympathetic and I'm empathetic to a degree too. But it's just like, yeah. oh, man. If he had mental, he, some people claim that he had, was that he had revealed to them that he was bipolar and he was suffering from depression off and on, and he had drug abuse problems, uh, alcohol abuse, I think maybe. And he, um, and he had talked about suicide in the past, and then this is crazy. He was dating Robert Mitchum's great granddaughter. And okay. she died of an overdose a year ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, she was quite a, quite a bit younger than him. She was, I think, 25 years younger than him, but they, you know, obviously were close. They were dating. And, yeah, she died from an overdose, and they were coming up on the one-year anniversary of her death, so some speculation was that that might have been tied into it. And then on top of that, he's a very social guy who's used to partying and being around people, and with the pandemic, you know, was stuck at home alone like everybody else has been. And I think it's just all... I'll wait on him, unfortunately. 
Mm-hmm. And everyone but else I had to watch. He's it. another one. He's another one where there were all, all the headlines were that he wrote Kangaroo Jack, and it's like <laughs> it's like Schumacher, <laughs> and they died on the same day, I think. And it's like they <laughs> their whole life, and the, the like the probably the most embarrassing thing maybe about you is the thing that people remember you for. Or the, I mean, life, most Americans cool. only know him because he was with Elizabeth Hurley. I mean, that was uh, right. You know, and had a and why, she uh, had a son, and there was the whole paternity dispute yeah. over it, and yeah. Yeah, and he never, uh, apparently never, ever met his son in person. Stellar. Just a stellar <laughs> gent. <laughs> but I have, um, I have friends who were <laughs> friends with him, and they loved him, and, you know, he was a great guy. And um, uh, Kelly Lynch, the actress, told a story that was in one of the, I think, Hollywood Reporter, that the first time she met him, he was sleeping on a couch at, at a friend's house in Malibu, and she thought he was homeless. <laughs> Because he's he was mm-hmm. known for always just being t-shirt and jeans kind of guy, even though he was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. He was mm-hmm. the heir to this big fortune. That's um, right. He got yeah. When he was like eighteen, he got like six hundred million dollars or something. Something like crazy like that. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh man. Anyways, rest in peace, Steve Bing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bo- mm-hmm. Bonnie Pointer, co-founder of the Pointer mm-hmm. Sisters, mm-hmm. passed away on June eighth at the age of sixty nine from cardiac arrest. Those, those guys Man. were they were some you know, they played the Ryman Theater the Grand Ole Opry those they, they were the first uh, uh, black group to play the Grand Ole Opry they had one country oh, song called Fairy Tale and they huh. I think they got I think they got booed off the stage because they weren't you know we're talking you know a different time period mm-hmm. and a different type of uh, audience they weren't expecting to see these uh, but I love that song Fairy Tale was a great song and uh, mm. I don't think they got the Grammy but they were nominated that year for that. Wow. Um, Mary Kay Letourneau, famous, famous <laughs> for, pedophile. famous, for, <laughs> fam, fam, yeah, famous for having sex with, uh, she was a teacher, and famous for having sex with one of her students when he was like 12 or 13, and went to prison, and the craziest thing about her story was she got this sweet deal that she got six months for having sex, legally, technically raping a boy. And she goes, she gets six months for it, gets out, and immediately gets caught with him again. And ends up going back to prison for years. But then she got out, and they got married, and they raised, she got two kids while she was going through all these trials and stuff with him. So she had two children with him, and he they got married and, like, had a family. What's that? I said, he had something she wanted. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But wow. they had, uh, in recent years, they had separated and then got back together. And he had, he says that eventually he came around to realize that their relationship was not healthy. Duh. <laughs> and she she passed away on July 6th. She was 58 from colon cancer. She had uh, a couple of children from a previous relationship that were, you know, mortified and humiliated by the whole and the whole situation but apparently that uh, at the end of her life they had patched things up and had a good relationship with her, good. Her, her previous children uh, before yeah she, she had been uh, the... she'd been married and I think he divorced her of course when all mm. this happened yeah because she wants she she wants the 12 year old well, you know stellar stellar that's weird <laughs> she claimed so weird. she didn't know I think she claimed she didn't know it was illegal okay to have sex with a 12 or 13 year old I she claimed she didn't know and had she known she never would have done it whatever anyways yeah, whatever. Um, speaking anyway. of ones that kind of deaths that kind of hit close to home uh, Grant uh, Imahara from uh, one of the hosts of Mythbusters You're a di- big fan? died suddenly I worked with him Oh, I got you? to work through through Discovery. I got to uh, I worked with him and the other co-hosts uh, Tori and Carrie uh, almost exactly two years ago. Uh, July twentieth, uh, it came up in my my memories. I think my Facebook memories. Uh, uh, Twenty eighteen, I worked with them on a shoot down in San Diego for the MythBusters experience, which is like a, a traveling museum exhibit. And then uh, and then I've since worked with Tori and Carrie on a couple other things for Discovery. So uh, super, all three of them are just incredibly nice, down to earth people so what kind great gig what a great generous gig. with their time yeah and they got a hell of a great gig and what's also interesting about them is both grant and tory had previous careers before they became famous working for ilm uh and i know i know tory was a model industrial light magic 
Oh, 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 okay. Yeah, George Lucas. Uh, uh, Tori, uh, Tori was a model builder, and I've uh, I talked to him about it once. I said, "Do you ever catch some of your movies on TV every once in a while and kind of stop?" And he's like, "Yeah, like he built some of the spaceships for Starship Troopers, and he'll you know every once in a while that'll be on TV, and he'll see one of his ships you know fly by." And uh, and I don't know, Grant was there too, and I don't know exactly what he did at ILM, but um, he worked on. All three of the Star Wars prequels. He worked on AI, artificial intelligence, you know, with Spielberg. Coincidentally, he worked on Galaxy Quest. And he worked on the Matrix sequels. He was at ILM for nine years. And I remember when we were when I when I filmed with him, he was kinda like he was the smart the smart science nerd of the group. If you needed something technical explained, the other hosts were kinda like have Grant explain it basically. Because he was mm-hmm. uh, he I think he had an engineering degree. So, um, but yeah, that was, a, that was a bummer. He died from a brain aneurysm on July thirteenth. He was only forty nine. Wow. And and those come on, you know, very suddenly. You know, my grandmother died from an aneurysm too, and it was just mm-hmm. she thought she had a headache, and she went to sleep, didn't wake up, and so it's kind of it's there's no warning with it, you know. Uh, Dan Hicks, star of Evil Dead Two, passed away on June thirtieth at sixty eight, cancer. Mm-hmm. Uh, Peggy Pope, who was a, a, a character actress, probably uh, maybe most famous for being in uh, Nine to Five. She's the the the, the secretary <laughs> that says "at a girl." <laughs> the old lush. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and uh, she also was recurring in Soap, and she was in The Last Starfighter, which is, was one of my favorite sci-fi movies growing up. Oh yeah, she was. Uh, I think she was one of the the people that lived in the trailer park uh, that the kid lived in. Uh, so that, anyways, <laughs> she passed away on uh, May twenty seventh, ninety one, and there was no cause given. But she wrote an autobiography called "At a Girl: Tales from a Life <laughs> in the Trenches of Show Business." <laughs> I love Isn't that it. Awesome. <laughs> Tales from the one movie that you'd be interested in reading about. And I did. <laughs> <laughs> from the three days that I was on set, probably right. <laughs> uh, bless her. But what a great, what a great. Uh, what a great uh, role. What a great yeah. tagline. Everyone knows it. Everyone, you know, well, not everyone. Atta girl. All the gay people, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, John Whiteley, who a lot of people may not know, but he was the recipient of a rare juvenile Oscar uh, for mm-hmm. the 1953 film The Little Kidnappers. And I believe he was British. And mm-hmm. Scottish. he was not, a, he was not, he, what was he? Scottish. Scottish, and he apparently was not able to travel to the U.S. for the Oscars, so they mailed his Oscar to him. And the juvenile Oscar was kind of like a little thing; it was like a little mini Oscar. And he said he was so yeah. excited, but when he saw it, he thought it was ugly, <laughs> and said that it ended up meaning absolutely nothing to him. And he didn't stay in a career as acting, but he actually became a highly respected art historian and museum curator in the UK and was made a chevalier of the French Order of Arts and Letters in 2009. So he was a highly respected art historian for a career. And he, he passed away on May 16th, 75, and I don't know the cause. But okay. There you go. Um, yeah. Bob, Kul- Bob Kulik, who oh, famously. The guitar guy. Yes. Auditioned to be the lead guitarist in Kiss, but lost out to Ace Frehley. Later played with them on their albums, Uncredited. And his younger brother, Bruce, also was in the band in the 80s and 90s. And uh, Bob Kulik died on May 28th at 70. No cause was given. Um, but when I was reading about him, it sounds like he just he wasn't in a good place life-wise mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. he died. So make of that what you will. Gene Kennedy Smith, the last surviving sibling of JFK, passed away on June 18th. Uh, she was 92. Uh, she was the second youngest in the family. She um, she was the uh, ambassador to Ireland, uh, the mm-hmm. U.S. ambassador. She was really an important part of the uh, the troubles with the IRA. You know, uh, she was uh, an integral part of you know trying to patch all that up. Uh, it's interesting. As, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Kennedy or uh, Clinton appointed her, hmm. and she and yeah, she was a uh, she was had a big. Role or in in the uh, the peace negotiations, mm-hmm, with them, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, which is interesting because of course her father Joseph Kennedy Senior was uh, was the ambassador to the UK I believe back in back around the time of the war. Mm-hmm. Stellar individual, <laughs> Joe Kennedy, top notch. <laughs> oh, one of the oh yeah, one of the good guys <laughs> for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Did you watch? Uh, I watched Chappaquiddick finally. Do you see that movie? 
all about you know Ted Kennedy did. and the and the, the you know driving off the bridge and killing. Yeah, and no, I'm real familiar. I, I don't know if I did see that movie. It's pretty. I, I'm, it's pretty good. It's all about basically how the Kennedy clan and the the lawyers and all their the powerful people around them came together, and to to protect Ted's reputation, basically. It's, so it was it's a documentary. No, it's a it's a film with actors. I have to um, I have to watch that because I know it was something the the Mary Jo Kopechny thing has always been something I've always been really fascinated with and I've always wanted to visit the bridge and Martha's Vineyard and all that sort mm -hmm. of business. So I'm, yeah. I'm definitely I gotta um, definitely write that down because I want to see that soon. It's um, it was um, who was in it? It was um. Well, Jim Gaffigan is in it, oddly enough, the comedian. He's excellent. Ed Helms is in it. He's almost unrecognizable. He's very good. Oh, my gosh. Uh, and um, Kate Mara plays Mary Jo. And um, Jason Clark plays Ted Kennedy. Hmm. Uh, it's really, it was really well done. I, I didn't, I mean, the story wasn't that interesting to me. It's just a story of a cover up, basically. It's a story of how they kind of had to work the press, and, and Ted kind of made up some mistakes along the way with it, you know, not going along with what they said he should do. And, and he was kind of the last hope for the family as far as political aspirations go, because this happened after uh, the assassinations. And he was mm -hmm. kind of, they, they were grooming him to hopefully be the president. And according to this film, anyways, he didn't really want it. He didn't mm -hmm. want what, he didn't want what, he, he, he uh, did not have a good relationship with Joe Sr. and did not want to do what his dad, didn't want to follow the path that his dad set out for him, basically. One of the Jerusalem path. I'm not a Kennedy historian, so I don't know how much of that is accurate, but that's how the film portrayed it. Mm -hmm. And then I saw on your page uh, the conjoined twins, the Galen brothers, died. <laughs> the, they were 68. They were the longest living conjoined twins in history, in known history. Yeah. 68 years old. They, they died on the 4th of July. Uh, they, of course, made money the, pretty much the only way they could, which was the Sideshow Act. And help support their all their whole family with that with those with yeah. that money. Um, thought those, they were um, conjoined like at the front, basically. So they were very awkwardly conjoined, and there was no way that they could uh, uh, separate them. And I read that uh, uh, her, 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 their parents had no idea they were even having twins. Oh, really? Yeah. So that had to uh, hurt. You know, that really you, had to hurt. You would you would think that would hurt a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they um, famously Unless they tried just to... didn't even play the game and did it, you know, the C-section and just took it out that way, you know. <laughs> right. I mean, because that would be, you probably physically impossible to, yeah. you know, give birth to co-joined twins Two babies normally. at the same time, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they tried to join the army, but were ranked 4F. <laughs> Duh. I don't know what that means. 4F is like the lowest, like you're medically not, not able to join the army. Oh, okay. Or in their case, I think it means four feet. <laughs> did they have four feet, or did they only have two? I don't remember. I think they had four because I think they were they were connected from like below the chest down to like the crotch area, but then I think they had four legs. I, I could be wrong okay. about that, but yeah. Anyways, I just there you love go. people like that. I love physically different individuals, I, or not even individuals. Mm -hmm. They're not. They were twins, but they were one. <laughs> I love that. I just love that stuff. It's, mm -hmm. uh, and I love the fact that they can embrace the curiosity aspect of it that people really want to know and uh, and I love that and from a health perspective you're tied to well, what the other person does you know one yeah. of them got a lung infection you know a few years ago and they almost died because of that because if one of them dies the other one dies and so I just had the thought of like what if one of them was like wanted to be like into fitness and stuff and the other one was like no I want to get fat it's you're yeah. stuck. You're stuck with that person's uh, yeah. decision. <laughs> I mean, you've got the um, the original Chang'eng bunker. Uh, you know, one of them died, and the other one died like an hour later. Uh, and uh, you know, they say he was he he was frightened to death or scared to death, uh, and that's how he died, just of fear. Uh, but Violet and Daisy Hilton, who were another pair, uh, famous pair of co-joined twins, they were in uh, Freaks and. Uh, they had a, they were in a couple of movies, but they were joined at the sort of like their buttock, and uh, and one got married, you know, and the other well they would they would have sex like you know <laughs> where the other one would be looking in the other direction and uh, and knitting or something reading while the other one's going to town. <laughs> so is a you know they can they it's fascinating. If, if that, I guess if that becomes your reality long enough, you just that's just your reality. Yeah. You, get, you get accustomed to that's how it is. Yeah. 
Hmm. Oh, that's right. There was a movie the Hilton sisters made called Change for Life, and they demonstrated that how how they would be sitting and they could sit so their backs were towards each other but they were still connected and the sister would kiss a man and the other one who wasn't uh, kissing him would feel it she would she, she would she would demonstrate really that she, you know just get these really kind of uh swoony looks you know while this one was kissing it's <laughs> interesting I, I doubt that that's true but that's how it was right. demonstrated huh um, some other names that passed away recently are Richard Hurd, who was Mr. Wilhelm on Seinfeld, passed away. Um, Anthony James, who was in Unforgiven and In the Heat of the Night, passed away. Uh, Marge Redmond from The Flying Nun. Uh, Mary Pat Gleason from A Cinderella Story uh, and Mom. Uh, Chris Truesdale from the boy band Dream Team. You a big fan of Dream Team? No. That's the first I've heard, and I don't mean any disrespect to Dream Team fans, but I've not heard that before. You do not want to bring Team Dream Team down on you. Uh, Jay Benedict, who was in The Dark Knight Rises, passed away. He passed away from coronavirus. Uh, Mel Winkler from Doc Hollywood and Devil in a Blue Dress. And Steve Priest, who was the bassist for the band Sweet, all passed. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, and then Hank Williams, Jr.'s, Hank Williams Jr.'s daughter, Catherine, died in a car accident last month. Uh, she was 27. That's a that sucks. Mm -hmm. That's a bummer. Yeah. I looked that up. She died. In a, she was in a car wreck. Uh, she was in a truck towing a trailer with her husband, towing a, a boat, I think, and lost control somehow and went across the line and rolled over, and and died. And her husband was seriously injured in it as well. And then um, Lisa Marie Presley's son Benjamin Kyo, mm -hmm. who is Elvis's grandson and looks a lot like him. Yeah, uh, uncannily looked a, a lot like him. Uh, and uh, and where did he die, Scott? Uh, well, Calabasas in their home in mm -hmm. Calabasas. In Wait, their, where uh, in their home though? What room? <laughs> well, you know what? Following in his grandfather's footsteps, he died on the toilet. Uh, he committed suicide. Shotgun to the. Uh, it was to the head. Originally, it was said that it was to the chest, but it was a shotgun yeah. wound to the head. And he uh, put it in his mouth. Yeah. Yeah like, Kurt, yeah, like Kurt Cobain, like a cross between Kurt Cobain and Elvis, basically. Yeah, Elvis is the only one who's died on the toilet using the toilet. Uh, right. There have been a lot of people that have died on toilets overdosing or committed suicide, but Elvis They is were the just only using one. it as a seat. Yes, yes. Right. But, uh, but it was so sad. He was, he was so young, and um, it's just messed up. I can't, I can't, I just, call, don't kill yourself. You know, just, just call somebody. Call Samaritans. Yeah. Call, there's suicide prevention. I mean... It, it just the yeah. uh, it's just there's options I understand but um, that's you know kid. that's the thing when I think about like Steve Bing you know 27 stories is a long ways to go down and a lot of time and you're thinking think. about it you yeah, are and, and a lot of you know I've seen you know people that have jumped off the uh, Golden Gate Bridge who have survived have said that you know immediately as soon as they let go they regretted it and I, f I feel that well about a lot of people as soon as they let go you kind of realize you you just did a, a permanent solution to a temporary problem and mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, that's it's horrible. Um, and I don't know the circumstances of his life. I don't know anything about his life. Uh, his sister is a, 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 a good, a successful actress. Riley Keough is his sister. Um, uh, Lisa Marie Presley is 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 troubled. Is is a kind word to you? Well, when when your ex husbands include both Michael Jackson and Nicolas Cage. <laughs> yeah. 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 This flew way under the radar somehow, but uh, Rosemary LaBianca, who was, of course, famously murdered by the Manson family the night after the Tate murders, uh, along with her, her husband, Lino, uh, Rosemary LaBianca's granddaughter was murdered mm. earlier this month. And how was she murdered? She was stabbed. She's stabbed to death, yeah. Stabbed and, uh, to was death. Was it Denver? Uh, yeah, she, she was stabbed to death in Denver on July 3rd. Uh, her name was Ariana Wolk. And so she was the daughter of Susan LeBur yes. Struthers, Rosemary's first husband, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, yeah, and, and in my opinion, the most the person if I could sit down and talk to anybody in this whole case, sure it'd be fun to talk to JC, we're gonna share and Tate. Susan is the one I would like to sit and talk to if I knew I could get right answers and ask her some real questions about the case. Ask her about Tex. Yeah, that's what yeah. I want to ask. About the whole, I mean, there's way, yeah, fascinating. Because she's so the one the that kind of infamously has communicated with Tex Watson, right? And has yeah. tried to forgive him. And she, yeah. I mean, there's, you know, Susan, her boyfriend hung out at the Spun Ranch, you know. Uh, she went out to support Tex Watson. 
I, you know, there's just anyway. If there's anyone I could talk to in the regard, and I knew I could get honest questions answers right. from it, would be it would be her. She um, she's got some. She's sitting on some stories. Wow. Uh, but anyway, the poor is... girl. And as amazing, I'm sorry, Mike. So so the girl has an amazing resemblance to Rosemary LaBianca. If you look right. at those pictures, and look, there's we always see that one really shitty picture of Rosemary LaBianca where like there's a side with her teeth out and stuff, and it's not flattering. <laughs> but there's a couple of really nice pictures of her smiling, and that She's girl pretty. had it. She had it. Yeah, it, she was a real resemblance there. What a shame. And l luckily, if there's any good news, they've already arrested a uh, suspect. Uh, he, a uh, 24 year old suspect was arrested about like, I think six days after the murder. So it must've hmm. sounds like it was someone she knew or something. If they zeroed in on the murderer that quickly, uh, yeah. and they arrested him. So at least sounds like there'll at least be justice. God. Um, is, is that it for the deaths? I mean, that was a lot. That was like, everyone. that was like 40, that was like 40 minutes of, yeah. of people dying. Uh, I do heaven. have one. I, I do have one <laughs> surprise for you, Scott. Yeah. Uh, I got you a small gift. I don't know if something you already have, so tell me if you do. But the other day, I landed a, a piece of the Walk of Fame. Oh, cool is that? <laughs> I'll hold it up to the camera for anybody watching the video. That's what it looks like. And, and if anyone from the Chamber of Commerce is watching, this is just a moment. It is a copy <laughs> no, of something here's from what, the here's, of I got it for fair and square. I was walking <laughs> down the sidewalk, and they had jackhammered a section. like I, They were doing repairs maybe or something, and they'd broken up a section of it, and there were just piles of it in the gutter. Oh, how cool just is that? Just laying there. Yeah, so I was like, it was a few weeks ago. So I like they're going to toss it in the dumpster anyways. So I grabbed a few pieces. So I got Thank you a piece you. of the Walk of Fame. And you can see, you know, the bits of white that are in it, you know, the white rock, yeah. whatever that is, quartz, I think, or whatever. So, yeah, there you go. So next time Very I cool. see you, Thank you, I'll hand it off. That's the, It's so interesting, the Walk of Fame. I think there was even a documentary about how they make those stars, that certain uh, recipe, that terrazzo that they make. But the Walk of Fame is, of course, iconic, but it's also a death trap. If you ever walk there when it rains... It is like ice. It's the <laughs> it was like it is. No. <laughs> it was not thought through. <laughs> it know? is the slickest surface you could possibly have on water, for sure, without it being frozen. Yes. I would love to know the, the statistics of the slip and falls, uh, you know, lawsuits <laughs> on the Walk of Fame. It would be really, really interesting. And, right. you know, they just raised the price now. I think it's 55000 for a star on the Walk of Fame now. It oh, really? Be, uh, it, it started uh, as an honor. And it was two or three thousand up until the '90s, and they started going up and up. And it was thirty thousand a few years ago, and all of a sudden, boom! It went up to uh, fifty thousand plus in the last two years for a star on the Walk of Fame. So if you get a star on the Walk of Fame, yeah, you have to qualify, but mm -hmm. you still got to you got to cough up fifty k to do it. Right. I'd do it. Would you? If it wasn't my money, yeah, I'd do like a GoFundMe. <laughs> <laughs> I would not. I would not. I would. I would say no. Give the money to somebody else who needs it. Fifty k uh, for a stupid cement. I mean, I know there's the affection of it, but I yeah. Don't, I, I don't. <laughs> now the Chinese theater, the footprints. That would yes. be the one. That to yes. me is that was bigger than an Academy Award. That is that is getting your footprints because there's only you know a hundred and some there right, of all time. So right. that to me is 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 a real special honor um do you have any hate mail hate mail you know no i you know there was only <laughs> the only thing i got that i bought i don't even bother anymore when i see them i just delete them uh but the <laughs> one that i found let's see if i can find this one it was a comment about the uh oh i did a video a couple of uh months ago about lucille ball's grave and because uh, I found a tabloid article for when she first was buried and she was in a little niche, a little cremation niche at Forest Lawn. And, uh, and one of the tabloids went for the headline of, you know, Lucy's family never visits her cheap grave. And it was, I just loved it. It made me laugh so hard. So I went there and I, and I shot some of it. And there are these crows in the background and, you know, just cawing through the whole thing. And I, I hate crows. They scare me. You know, they, to me, they're, they're symbolic from Damien Omen too. You know, they peck your eyeballs out. They're just nasty. And they're smart. Yes. So I always, I call them death birds. So when I was <laughs> during this video, I said death birds, death birds. And, and so somebody, uh, somebody wrote, crows are not death birds. They, granted ravens, provided no notification. The water was down and provided food. 
to the prophet Elias. The Western religionist made the crow evil, not the Eastern Orthodox world. <laughs> Crows are God's creatures. So, um, okay, there was that one. And, and now this one was, I'm not sure which was this was a, a re response to. I mean, it was somebody's murder, and I forget which one. It says uh, somebody... See, you were, looking, you were looking at crows with your white privilege, Scott. Your Western right. white privilege view of the world. That's... No, don't trigger me. Don't <laughs> trigger me. <laughs> I'm feeling very marginalized right now. <laughs> um, the other one was somebody wrote a comment about something I did revolve, involving somebody that died was murdered or something. It, says, it said, ritual sacrifices. Hollywood, Hollywood is nothing but perverts, all in caps, perverts, mm. pedophiles, drug addicts, and alcoholics. To glorify them is to worship at the altar of Satan. All right. That's it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> the end. <laughs> uh, I saw somebody, uh, somebody gave us a three-star review, um, but said only because there are not enough episodes. Yeah, fair enough. So. <laughs> and thank you for the three-star review. Yeah, I'll take Sorry it. we failed you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a fair criticism. We did take a month off, so mm -hmm. I guess we deserve to, to lose a couple stars for that. <laughs> Go back and listen to the old ones. They're what the industry calls evergreen because they're historical based. They never get old. There you are. Mm -hmm. The historic documents. The historic documents. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, all right. Do we want to get into the uh, main feature? Sure. It's time for the main feature. We're talking Grease, the 1978 musical, and uh, I apologize in advance. Uh, you, you you may be shocked by this, Scott. I had never seen the movie up until a few weeks ago. Okay. I watched it for the first time only because we were going to do this episode. So really? I you know it's not and it was it was a little painful for me as a as, <laughs> it was a little painful it was a little rough really? it had some good it had some good it had some good parts it deserves its status as a classic but i'm not a big musical fan to begin with so mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. it's a little tough but um but it, it is uh, 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 an icon uh, an icon in film history you know it deserves you know, its place it is it started originally as a as a play about mm -hmm. a high school outside of chicago and it is not a family story it is not a family movie, really. If you if you listen to the songs your kids are you know singing along to when they go to the Hollywood Bowl and wearing their little fifties jackets, you know they're talking about pussy. They're talking about uh, uh, rape. They're talking about uh, you know uh, all. I mean, it just it's. Right. You know the chicks will cream. You know the, the, this Did is all these are lyrics. Yes. <laughs> right. They, yeah. It's just. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's in there that is really um, uh, the you know the getting lots of tit. Uh, you, you know you ain't no you ain't no, you know you ain't that sh wait. You know you ain't you ain't no shit because you're getting lots of tit. That's what in grease lighting. I mean these are the lyrics your kids are singing along to. So uh, I, I just want to say I love them. We talk about broken rubbers. We talk about a chick getting pregnant in the back of a car. You know, uh, right. it's wholesome it's, family it's, Disney stuff. Yeah. Yeah. What's up, Kaniki? One guess. You know, it's like these are uh, <laughs> these are your kids. You know, so it's, it's, it's a lot well, his famous line, a, a hickey from Kaniki is like a Hallmark card or something like that. That yeah, famous line yeah. from uh, Jeff Conaway, yeah. Which was a real hickey, by the way. That was a that was something he did the night of. Uh, really, Stalker Channing. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> but uh, when they wild. made when they made the movie, because it was based on this original play, uh, it was ran on Broadway for years. They got three of the original actors from the Broadway cast to do the movie. Uh, being Travolta, who played Duty, who was like mm -hmm. the second T-Bird. Um, uh, uh, Jamie Donnelly, who played Jan in the movie and on, on, on uh, Broadway. And uh, who was the third one? Um, Jeff, Conway Jeff Conway was Jeff, in it at one yeah, point, too. Who yep. played Danny Zuko. Uh, yep. Although he didn't originate. Barry Bostwick from Rocky Horror was the original Danny Zuko. And then, uh, but yet John, John Travolta never played a lead on Broadway. And Kinnicky, huh. or uh, and Jeff Conaway did. So when Jeff Conaway did the movie, it was like pegs taken down because he was he was mm. the, he was the guy. He was the one that right. had the history of the show, and also he he's the guy that had the song "Grease Lightning" on in Broadway, and he took it away and, and gave it to uh, Travolta. And on and adding more drama to that, I think him and Travolta had the same manager at the same time at that time. Interesting. As well. Yeah. So yeah. 
It's uh, it was it had to be Jeff Conaway. You know, had a, was a troubled individual, but he had to eat a lot. He had to eat a lot of shit too. You know, I mean, because mm-hmm. it, it, it's like a real kick in the nuts to an actor who desperately wants people to like them and wants to get stuff. And rejection's hard for actors. And then they to get accepted but not as what you're well known for and then to have this taken away it's like castration in a slow agonizing way and he seemed to be one of those moody actors who wasn't content a lot of times with what he was doing yeah. well, with taxi being a perfect example he didn't he thought he was wasting his time and doing the same scenes over and over again on taxi and took for granted that hey it's a great high paying job on a really popular TV series. You know, don't I'm sorry if head, you don't man. feel uh, sorry <laughs> if you don't feel artistically fulfilled by it, but you know millions of people would kill for that, but he made the point that anybody could have played the role that he was playing whereas the other characters on that show really had to be played by, you know, DeVito and and the rest were kind of their own unique characters. He felt like anybody could play a dumb wannabe actor, which is what he played. Okay. I mean, then, okay, that's fair enough. I get that's that, what but feel. also, but it got to be him, so why not? You know what I mean? <laughs> yep. I, don't quit the I hit. Always, <laughs> don't quit the hit. Exactly. Um, but then you add in he had you know long uh, line of, of substance abuse problems throughout his life with po- uh, yeah, painkillers and cocaine and alcohol. Wasn't he the first in the first season of uh, Celebrity Rehab? Uh, he was like the most famous. Uh, yeah, of them, and he he um, claims that he warned Corey Haim about his prescription drug abuse, and he supposedly told Corey Haim, "You you're gonna die, you know." And he said Haim responded, "Yeah, probably." Mm-hmm. And that was not long before Haim died from prescription drugs. So that's another one of those things where you could probably, I guess, recognize the disaster in someone else's eyes if you have that in right. common with them. And they so, only uh, died about a year apart, I think, too, because I think Conway yeah. died the following year. So, yeah, yeah he, he might have seen really... this younger actor on the same spiral that he was on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He was in really bad shape, Jeff Conway. When I saw him the last time at one of those uh, autograph shows that I go to, I mean, he couldn't even walk. He was in a walker. He had some, he had this uh, this uh, orthopedic sort of I don't want to call it a girdle, but it was just, it was an entire wraparound support piece. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was really he was in really bad shape, and and surrounded himself with some really questionable people at the end too. It was a uh, yeah, just a disaster, a real disaster of a of a. Well, of a, and of I think the story Nobody where he warned Haim was he was at a party. At, they were both at a party party at Corey Feldman's house. So, mm-hmm. uh, uh, no no further comment on that one. But he he uh, he he passed away technically from aspiration pneumonia and encephalop encephalopathy mm-hmm. on May 27, 2011 he was only 60 um, but his doctor you know who was you know uh, handling his case when he passed away said that aspiration pneumonia is common with drug overdoses so he didn't die technically of a drug overdose but he died of the the side effects of it the direct cause of his death was the aspiration or whatever but yeah mm-hmm. he was probably which is when material you know, a, a lot of material from your mouth and your stomach get into your lungs and it's mm-hmm. something that happens when you overdose so it was mm-hmm. the side effect of overdosing, basically. Mm-hmm. R.I.P. A very troubled individual. And to your point about him being, you know, uh, kind of, you know, physically disabled at the end, he was apparently very depressed and kind of suicidal. That that's what he had kind of been reduced to. That he had mm-hmm. had his mobility taken away from him, and and couldn't live without help, basically. Uh, there's so many ugly stories. Uh, there was somebody he was with that claimed. Uh, you know, through through her own funeral for him, and no one in the family would have anything to do with her, and wouldn't show up at the funeral. It was just really <laughs> ugly, just a really ugly, ugly bunch of circumstances. Yeah. It's just too bad. But uh, um, yeah, he 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 was a troubled individual. So rest in peace. It's kind of funny when they were doing the uh, the auditions for Greece. I mean, it's if you. I was I was doing a tally of the ages of the people that were in Greece when they were filming Greece. <laughs> right. And, and we were talking about how when they when they did auditions they had to do a crow's feet test of the yeah, actors <laughs> just to see things. Because Stocker Channing was thirty three when she played Rizzo. Uh, and, Olivia uh, Newton Sandy, John da- Dame Olivia yeah. Newton John was twenty nine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and almost I, did, she claimed she almost didn't take the role because she was concerned that she was too old. <laughs> yeah, the screen test. Yeah, she she insisted on the screen test. 
So Channing was 33. She, they painted freckles on her face. Alan Carr, the producer, uh, uh, saw her on camera and just walked up to her with a brown eyebrow pencil and started putting freckles on her face to make her look younger. Travolta was 23. Uh, Jeff Conway, 26. Olivia Newton-John had her 29th birthday on the set. So, uh, so yeah, they were, they were well past the 16, 17-year-old uh, phase that uh, they were supposed to be in, which is, which is kind of another one of the funny parts about that movie, I think. Right. Uh, but Alan, Alan Carr, who was the producer of this movie, it, it, he, they did a documentary about him a couple of years called The, Fab the Fabulous Life of Alan Carr. Have you seen it? Uh -huh. I it's, haven't, no. He, <laughs> he is a right. I mean, this guy is the most over-the-top queen. You know, he'd walk around his house in, in caftans, and and uh, and he had a disco in his basement, and he had like mounds of cocaine, and everybody was going to his house. <laughs> Benedict Canyon, and uh, and uh, everyone would go to his house at all hours. I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic um, uh, uh, documentary. Jeffrey Schwartz does it. Who? Yeah, I know. Who's Jeffrey. Actually I, think the, I, ha I think I yeah. have seen it because I'm friends with Jeffrey. Yeah, me too. Because he did and the he, I he, Am Divine documentary too. Right. And so he Jeff, did the one on. Um, <laughs> and he did the one on uh, on um, Tab Hunter. Yes. Yes. This, uh, the Alan Carr one, because Alan Carr, you know, he did uh, Can't Stop the Music, he, uh, he did La Caja Full, and he did, uh, famously, his sort of swan song, or swan dive, was the uh, 1989 Academy Awards, which is the one that set the precedent for, this is how bad it gets. But to <laughs> me, I think, no, that's the best it gets, because that was, that was the greatest the greatest Oscars to me ever was that one, and that's the one we're still talking about because uh, you know he, he it started out with um, with Snow White singing mm -hmm. uh, with Rob Lowe. And, it almost um, killed Rob Lowe's career. That's how bad yeah. it was. But you know it's funny because I had a, there's a woman I know her name is uh, Bernadette, and she came on the tour one time and she says, "Oh yeah, my sister Eileen, she was Snow White in the Academy Awards." I'm like, "Your sister's freaking Eileen Bowman? Oh my god!" You know, so so <laughs> she brought I Bernad and she brought Eileen on the tour and I made her sit and tell sit through it because I had it on the video. <laughs> the whole there's like a 10 minute introduction to this thing. It was over the top, wonderful production number with rockets and a giant Chinese theater for a hat. And, and, uh, and uh, Merv Griffin comes out singing, and like he's at the Coconut Grove, and it was they they had these tables set up like the Coconut Grove restaurant, and mm -hmm. uh, in the Ambassador Hotel, and then he Merv Griffin singing because he used to sing at the Ambassador Hotel, and he says I'm going to introduce to you these more these immortals and Vincent Price and Coyle Brown, Roy Ro Rogers and Dale Evans, Sid Charisse <laughs> and, and Tony Martin, they're all at these tables and they all get up during this production number. Dorothy Lamour, and this is the last time these people were ever seen, and it was the last right. time. Lucy was ever seen in public too. That was her last appearance. So people dog on Alan Carr, but I will defend him to the end because he, man, he knew how to put on a show, and uh, and it, and people hated it, hated it. They just thought it was ridiculous, and it was. But that's how fun it was. Busby Berkeley's been doing it since the beginning of time, you know, <laughs> since the beginning of movies. So I don't know. Very unappreciated. I I love Alan Carr. I do. God bless him. And and he saw the value of Greece. He um he uh, Robert Stigwood, the producer, who uh, who was on a roll. He went straight from Greece to Saturday Night Fever. Uh, Stigwood was the producer of these things, and, and Alan Carr was involved in all that. And both Greece and Saturday Night Fever are like the two top-selling soundtracks of all time, or one mm -hmm. of them anyway. Yeah, so, um, I think, anyway, I'll uh, stop Olivia, going off on Olivia Newton-John said a uh, she, at the time she was only the second uh, singer in history to have two top five Billboard hits at the same time, and they were both songs from the movie in '78. Those both of those both of those songs were written for the movie. Uh, there were three songs that were written for the film that weren't in the original play. You're the one that I want, which was released before the movie as a single, and it was a hit song by the time the movie came out. And hopelessly devoted to you, which was up for an Academy Award for best song and lost to Donna Summer, uh, Last Dance. And the other one that they they made for the. Um, Hopelessly devoted to you, Summer Nights, and... Uh, and Olivia Newton-John performed that song at the Oscars, I believe, too. Oh, did she? Hopelessly devoted to you? Yep. But it is interesting to note that there were some people that were a lot, that were up for the roles, that, that wouldn't take the parts. Uh, uh, Henry Winkler was offered the role of Danny. Uh, Carrie huh. Fisher was offered the role of Sandy. Lucy Arnaz was offered the role of... Um, 
of uh, Rizzo, but she was, and uh, but I, she, I forget why she didn't do it. <laughs> Harry Reams from Deep Throat, he was going to be Coach Calhoun, and uh, and then the producer said, no, 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 we can't have a porn star in this movie, so that's where they got yeah, in, our, in our wholesome musical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he wanted <laughs> Ellen Carr. God, I love Ellen Carr. He wanted Andy Warhol to be the. Uh, uh, to be like a t one of the teachers at the school. I mean, he, huh. he was like, you know, it was cool. He, uh, Alan I love Alan Carr. He was so ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and you know who else was in it? Michael Bean. Michael Bean, B I E H N. He, I knew him because he was in a, a weird slasher movie in the '80s called The Fan. He was in The Abyss. He was in the uh, the Terminator. And he, his first movie part was in Greece. And he, it's just a, he's an extra. There's a point where there's a scene when they're at the science uh, lab and, and somebody he pulls a, um, a frog out of, uh, what's her face, Patty Simcox's uh, uh, purse. And then there's another scene where John Travolta is, uh, is auditioning to be in different sports. And he plays basketball, uh -huh. and some guy takes the ball from him, and Travolta punches him in the stomach. That's Michael Bean, who does oh, his first okay. ball, So it's kind of cool that they have a, uh, it's like a little cameo of somebody on there. Mm -hmm. And um, but anyway, <laughs> that's Frankie, all. Frankie that's Avalon. It. Frankie Avalon was in it. He didn't want to do it because he didn't want to be typecast, and <sighs> uh, and because it was a teen idol. You know, she shows right. up pondering her future as a beauty queen or beauty uh, beautician, and and and, uh, and he said no, I don't want to do it. But then he reconsidered it, and it ended up being his most requested song. So, huh. uh, but I remember when Grease came out because I saw it several times. Of course, I did. And uh, but Beauty School Dropout when that came out that was everyone's bathroom break I remember that so vividly this everyone's uh, like loving the movie and as soon as that song came on it would be like 50 people going out to use the bathroom it was like their uh, it's like their little intermission <laughs> did you ever go I can't to the believe you didn't, you didn't at least I can't believe you didn't enjoy this movie at all that's so funny I enjoyed a few parts of it it's not that I hated the whole thing but there's it's mm -hmm. it's yeah it's a little, it was a little tough uh, the, um, have you ever gone to the sing along screenings no. No. They did. I think they released it like a, a ten years ago, or, or for one of their anniversaries, they did like a new theatrical release, and it was they did sing along, you know, kind of like with Rocky Horror, right? They did these mm -hmm. like sing along screenings, which is on another one you wouldn't want your kids to do, you know? <laughs> it's so weird. Here, here's little, here's little, you know, Becky from Minnesota doing "Touch a Touch a Touch Me in a Bra," you know? <laughs> it's like no, I, I just I, you know, it's so funny that you know people look at Pretty Woman as another one of those movies. Like, oh, I love that movie. It's a rom com. It's really raunchy, you know. I mean, that's right. not a judgment, but it's really you know, it has her going down on Richard Richard Gere during the movie, and it's pretty trashy. So mm -hmm. um, it's just fascinating to me that people are you know sort of being able to remove that part of it, and uh, and. Uh, it's that. like uh, you I, know, Sting is, I think Sting has commented on people using every breath you take for, as like their wedding song, and it's like it's about stalking. Mm -hmm. It's not a healthy love song. Like. No, no, no. I know it's the other or, one, YMCA or, 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 people. <laughs> <laughs> right. YMCA is about guys getting off in a bathhouse. You know what I mean? Right, it's right, just right. Like, Bruce it's Springsteen just, uh, is born in the USA is not a positive patriotic song. No, it just has no. a patriotic sounding chorus. Or, or another one verses, is um, <laughs> when they play white lines at weddings. You know, I mean, it's, it doesn't take that that long to figure out what lines is really what, about. Cocaine, what the lines you know? are I mean, of. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's it's just listen to the you know lyrics for five seconds. It, it talks all about it. You know, about the drugs, and uh, it's not even masked. I mean, it's literally about the drug. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's. Funny. <laughs> I was going to say, I read that there was, um, there was a lost shot uh, that was supposed to be at the end of the movie that, is, that, that was due to a, 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 um, like a lab error was, was lost. And there was supposed to be a final shot, of a, a final kiss between Danny and Sandy at the end of the movie. And uh, uh, the lab or somebody accidentally destroyed it. I did not realizing that there wasn't another print of it or, or destroyed their only print. And apparently there is a version of it that is in black and white that they do still have. And they've, they've uh, several times over the years have attempted to colorize it so that they could add it back into the film. And so far they haven't liked how realistic the colorizing looks so they've never done it but there is a, a lost shot of them kissing at the end and apparently they couldn't get the budget to go and do a pickup scene for it so it's just not in the movie 
You mean the car really didn't fly at the end? <laughs> <laughs> that was really bad. That was really, really bad. That one, I'm on board with that. I thought it but there was, was, I think they were supposed to kiss, like, because they're, they're in the back seat or whatever, right? And I think there was supposed to be one last shot of them kissing, and that, that shot got lost. So you didn't, I didn't the, you didn't that. get the, you didn't get the last kiss. You would think though, with the with technology today, that they could colorize it realistically enough now that it would be believable. Yeah. I mean, they can create actors who are dead on screen and have yeah. it be pretty believable. You'd think they Convincing. could colorize it, but yeah. yeah. So they hey, released maybe one of these days they'll do it in 4K not that long ago. I didn't get it yet, but you know what I did get the other day on 4K. Uh, I don't have a 4K TV, but I have Blu-ray. And I got I, ju- I just got the new edition of Jaws that came oh, out. Oh, right on! If you you I I love it. It's really one of my favorite movies ever. I've probably seen it twenty or twenty five times. Mm-hmm. It's like watching a new movie, and I'm not even kidding. This movie is everything. You can see the hairs on everyone's head. Wow. You can read every sign in the background. I mean, it's it was distracting because it was so good. Because it's like you're seeing it for Jaws. the first time almost. Yeah, I, I watched it on the 4th of July, and I had an old DVD copy, and it was like, I really enjoyed it. I watched it again like two weeks later, and I was like, my eyes were popped out of my head. This is so, I'm seeing stuff I didn't even know was there. I'm hearing stuff, conversations mm-hmm. that I didn't know happened in the movie. It's it's really good. I cannot recommend that enough. I, uh, I have a 4K setup. I have the 4K player with the 4K TV, so I've started getting 4K discs. And uh, the funny thing is normally i found with older movies like that is all you get is just more film grain. <laughs> yeah, it's, no. it's basically there's not that much extra resolution really. Um, but that's really interesting to hear that Jaws, they did a really nice restoration job. Unbelievable. I don't know what they're going to do for the 50th because this is the 45th anniversary uh, this <laughs> year. But what, what the hell are they going to do then, you know, have a no, 3D? They're, re- they're releasing I mean? like, 8K, yeah. <laughs> it, oh my god no it was it was i mean i heard you know i could hear the things that the chick was uh when she was getting eaten you know she could say oh my god it hurts i never heard her say that before but uh, you know you could they they matched they did the the sound oh, mm-hmm. it was it was amazing i cannot tell you it is like watching a whole other movie and every time i watch it now i think about that um that case about the the girl that was murdered did you i think we've even talked about this in one of our earlier episodes they they had a uh, there was a girl that was murdered. Her body was found uh, along a road there where, near where the f- film was filmed, and she was there at the time that the film was being made. And some uh, somebody thinks that they spotted her in the movie as an extra. <laughs> well, no, I'm sorry to be in a, I've never Which, heard this story before in my yes, life. <laughs> she's in, she's a, she passes by in one of the crowd scenes at like uh, the beach or at the dock or something on the pier or wherever it is. You he claims you can see her, but. It's really in the eye of the beholder. I mean, she's dressed similarly to how the, this woman was dressed when she died. But Is this real? Have you looked this up at all? Is yes, this just yes, yes, yes. Yes, it's a real theory. I don't really buy it, but they have, they've shown the screenshots from the film. You can see the, the, the girl that they think is the girl uh, that hmm. was murdered and that, that maybe there's a clue in the movie to how she was killed. I don't, I don't even completely believe that it's even her. Just it's like it the Munchkin kind of that hanged himself at the Wizard yeah. of Oz, you know. It could be but anybody, still. so I don't really buy it. But it's interest. It's interesting that people have given the theory, that theory like some air. I didn't, you know, and maybe maybe watching it in 4K will answer some questions too. That's a really good point. Perfect faces of people that I didn't even know, you know, existed in the movie, and you see them smiling 50 yards in the background. I mean, it's bizarre. Uh, Jaws mystery did long unknown. Lady of the Dunes, Cape Cod murder victim, appear in movie scene. Hmm. So if you look up uh, Lady of the Dunes and Jaws, if you Google it, you'll find this whole story. And uh, there's a um, guy named Joe Hill, who's author of uh, Strange Weather, has a theory linking the longstanding Cape Cod murder mystery to his favorite movie, Jaws. Oh, and if you go to if you go on USA today's site they have a screenshot from the film that shows the woman he thinks is the girl wow it's not a very well-known story i I, I, you know i'm even yeah i I have my eyes and ears open to everything jaws related because i just love the movie so much but uh i'm surprised so yeah definitely going to look into that definitely i'll 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 link the article on our facebook page when we uh, when we put this out uh, I, got to meet, about... uh, I got to meet the chick who was uh, the girl that got eaten at the beginning of the movie. Her name's Susan Baclini. 
and uh-huh. uh, and I had a rubber hand, a severed hand that I had her on crap. <laughs> <laughs> and she wrote it. She signed it. Eat me. <laughs> yes, that's amazing. Was I that, that a, too, was but... that at like a convention? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's so cool because they have they have you know so many people. That should be, actually that'd be a really interesting one to do. We should do that a Jaws one. I'd love to. Let's not talk about it anymore. <laughs> Let's just do a <laughs> so Jaws. Save one. it for the Seriously. Jaws episode. Oh, that would I would be great. totally into that. That would be a good one. That would be a okay. really good one. I think that will be our next show. will be Jaws. That would be good. Um, do you want to talk about Sid Caesar? You know, Sid Caesar was, uh, I mean, he was, he was uh, God, they call him the Charlie Chaplin of television. I mean, he was, uh, yeah. uh, he was really I mean, at the forefront of it. And speaking of Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks, they were both writers. You know, they early yeah. in their careers were writers under him, as was Neil yeah. Simon, Woody Allen, um, Larry Gelbert, who went on to co-create MASH, was one of his writers. Yeah, like yeah. It's, he was like a, a, a writer's lab for all the great mm-hmm. comedian write, comedic writers that came out of that generation. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. And he was another one. That I, I really enjoyed him when he acted normal, you know, like a normal person. Mm-hmm. Because he was one of those people like Jim Carrey and like Robin Williams that could just go, they start going off on one of their tangents and I just got to walk away because it makes me so uncomfortable <laughs> because they're so <laughs> intense right? and they're right. so everywhere. You can't predict what they're going to do and, and it really makes me really uncomfortable. But uh, but he is, um, you know, <laughs> but you know, but I like him when he's being a person that's, that is reined in that is doing mm-hmm. a role because he's, he's been in, in some fun movies, too. He's been in uh, he's been in a lot of Mel Brooks stuff. Actually, I remember he was in Silent Movie. He was in History of the World Part One. He mm-hmm. was in Air, I think he was in Airport 75. He was in uh, both. The it's Greece a mad, 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 mad world. Mad, yeah. Which is another you know, there's another one I could go on about for a couple of hours with all the people yep. that are in that movie. So, uh, so yeah, he was a, a well-regarded uh, uh, television genius. He and Imaging Coca, uh, your show of shows, yeah, they were they were um, television gold, really, really. He passed the Munsters' away Revenge. On... Sorry, the Munsters' Revenge. That's the one I never want to forget. <laughs> he was in the Munsters' Revenge movie. It's a good movie. Was that one of the TV <laughs> movies they did? The reunion movies? Yeah, yeah. I, they might have even did. They may have even done a theatrical release. I think that might have been theatrical. Oh uh, wow! The Munst- Yeah, yeah. I think it was, and that was cool because that was, you see my own color. Yeah, it was the first time we saw Lily Munster and, and those guys mm-hmm. in color. That was that was cool. That was really cool. He was also in Vegas Vacation. Mm-hmm. And uh, he passed away on February 12th, 2014, 91, another one of these guys that lived into his 90s, after uh, what was described as a short illness. And tragically, his son uh, was a doctor. And this is interesting. Sid Caesar was six foot two. His son was six foot eight and, oh, was, wow. a, a, and was an MD. And he died just a few months after Sid did hmm. from uh, complications following a surgery, they said. Interesting. So, yep, barely outlived his dad. That's a that's a bummer. So, oh, a couple of other fun facts about the movie, uh, which which uh, I learned afterwards. The Pepsi was a sponsor of the movie, and huh. there's a couple of points where Pepsi show up in in like when Olivia and John singing her song. There's a crate of Pepsi behind her, the logo. Uh, but what they overlooked was then they when they did the uh, the diner scene that uh, in the background is a big Coca-Cola sign, and they had to blur it out. If you look at the movie, I mean, there's this huge Hollywood production movie, and it is literally blurred out. It, right, it's like front and center, right in the middle of the screen. It's, uh, wow. it, it's kind of, it's funny. Uh, but yeah, that's, I, I didn't realize that even back then, the products were doing sponsor, uh, sponsorships in movies in 1978. That is really um, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so you know the, there's a, there's that song that Stocker Channing sings, "Look at me, I'm Sandra D." Where they put she puts the blonde wig on and pretends mm-hmm. to be uh, a prim and the, proper is that, and is sweet. Is that the sleepover scene, like the slumber yes. party? Yeah, yeah. So they they changed the lyrics of the song for the movie because the lyrics were about Salminio, and she says, "Elvis, Elvis, let me be, keep that pelvis far from me." Well, originally oh. in the play, it was "No, no, Salminio, I would never stoop so low." And they uh, now keep your just keep your cool. Now you're starting to drool. Well, they took that verse out because Sal Minio was killed, murdered the year before that. So right. they changed it to Elvis. And while they were filming the movie, the very day they were filming that scene is the day Elvis died. 
<laughs> so they were they, they they learned that Elvis was dead, and in the movie that same day they're seeing after they got the news that El, you know, Elvis let me be keep the pelvis far from me, which is kind of funny. So so there's they 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 try to uh, to avert some sort of weird uh, politically correct crisis or sensitivity issue, and boom. And, and I just realized I uh, well I, I knew I was going I knew my birthday was coming up, but in two weeks I will turn the age that Elvis was when he died. Oh really? Okay. He died at forty-two. Yep, 42. I will be forty-two in a couple of weeks. Wow, forty-two. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. So wait, how? Old, what year were you born? Seventy-eight. I was born the same year as Greece. Okay. I'm as old as Greece. Okay. All right. <laughs> So it's really your look, the whole thing. <laughs> it is all influenced by your birth. <laughs> That's the it. whole thing. <laughs> now, okay, so some of the okay, we we talk about Eve Arden. Eve Arden was another t- like cut from the same cloth as Sid Caesar, except more sane. But she mm-hmm. was another uh, legend of television. You know, she was. And she was really the principal in the movie, right? Yes, that's right. She was like the American Maggie Smith, you know. She 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 and Maggie mm-hmm. Smith had that look of contempt or disgust down, you know, <laughs> right. to, to a T. And her her actual her real name was Eunice Quedens, which I it's like one of my favorite original names ever. But she was tight with Lucy, uh, really uh, really tight with Lucy. They were best mates. And and uh, Armis Brooks was the television show that put Eve Arden on the map. And that was a that was a Desi Lu production after I Love Lucy. So, and, do, you think they ever, I, do you think her and Lucy ever watched Jeopardy together? God, do you know what? Lucy was a freaking game show monster. I was just watching her on some weird show. From the, she was so competitive, but she always went on those game shows. And she took that shit really seriously. And not in a nasty way. She's fascinating to watch. I forget. What was this? It was a... It was something that she it was she was set up with it was Richard Simmons was on this thing and it was like a charades thing and uh, it was it's really fascinating <laughs> but Lucy was a a competitive uh, player. I was gonna say I, I could see how it would be in her nature to be competitive naturally. So yeah, you could see yeah. on any situation. Speaking of game shows, we mentioned Steve Martin earlier. Um, I don't know if we ever talked about this, but he went on the dating game show three times. You know the one where they there's the three yeah. guys and the girls behind the wall and whatever. He went on that show three times and he claims all three times he won. The oh, girl well, that would be him. difficult to find if you. That Google. was in the late you know, late sixties, early seventies yeah. before he became really famous. Yeah. Um, and he uh, and you can actually find one of them. I have seen it's on YouTube. It's inter- it's really interesting. Him on the dating game and yeah. It's uh, pretty you, 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 the dating game, which was uh, you know he. he, he um, Got Farrah Fawcett, Tom Selleck, uh, uh, Ann B. Davis. Uh, I've watched him <laughs> with her. Uh, Rodney Alcala, the serial killer. He was on. He was on an yep. episode like after he killed three people and before he killed others. And uh, Agnes Moorhead. I mean, there's insane people showed up as guests on the Dating Game. And a lot of people like Steve Martin before they got famous because Steve Martin was a hugely successful writer. You know, for the Smothers Brothers. Right. And, and, and that's so, right. He was already writing at the time. At least when I watched the one um, that's on YouTube, he mentions that he's a writer for I think the Smothers Brothers. So he. Was I wonder if they even moment. shot it there. They probably shot. It was like the next stage over at uh, right. CBS. Right. Just walk Beverly, over and do you know? the Dating Game. Yeah. But we need it, we need you know, someone. It, it's common though for even today for these you know reality shows and you know game shows and stuff for people that you know aspiring actors they go on these shows to get screen yeah. time you know to get their yeah. face on TV and then eventually they get you know famous so uh, that's me again with the sirens sorry but I love that show it's a fixture it's a definite sixties fixture so uh, another now so Eve Arden died. Um, Oh, she was in the famous Lucy episode where she goes to the Brown Derby and with uh, with uh, William Holden with the spaghetti and the scissors. I think we've talked about that as many times as we've talked about Manson somehow. Okay, that specific episode. I don't know how she she's in that. Yeah, yeah, because she said she says I don't know. She sees Eve Arden. She goes, "Did anyone ever tell you you look like Eve Arden or something like that?" And, oh, interesting. And does, but it was another. It's deadpan. Eve Arden was totally deadpan. And uh, and she uh, she passed away uh, up in the Hollywood Hills at um, November twelfth, nineteen ninety. She was eighty two years old, and uh, she's buried in, uh, at Westwood with her husband Brooks West. So, and she um, died from heart disease. Yeah, and Dodie Goodman, who was the the kooky secretary uh, at, at in the office, she was uh, with a, somebody. I, I read this description of her voice that somebody as a Tweety Pie cartoon bird. 
strangle it. No, <laughs> wait a second. Let me get this again. <laughs> they described your voice. A Tweety Pie cartoon bird strangling on a peanut. <laughs> is how her voice was described. <laughs> But a lot of that stuff was ad libbed. The stuff with the typewriter ribbon and you know uh, in the office. That was they. You know both uh, Eve Arden and Dodie Goodman were like old pros. You know they were like practically vaudeville. The stuff they were doing. You know, and uh, and then they the director let him go. The director Randall Kleiser. Uh, he's the guy that produ- he he directed John Travolta in The Boy in the Plastic Bubble, and uh, <laughs> and that's how they met. And and he directed Grease. And but they said that he would just let the old timers go. They knew how to ad lib. They knew what they right. could do to get a good laugh. And Dodie Goodman and uh, Eve Arden were two of those people that they uh, that they let go, and 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 thankfully so because there were some pretty funny parts that they did together. And mm-hmm. Dodie Goodman uh, passed away. Uh, she was also in Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. I mean, that was a soap opera that was really really groundbreaking in the seventies. A bizarre Norman Lear soap opera drama, insane show. If you, I mean, there's. A child preacher, a guy drowns in a, a soup bowl, a, a, a country western singer in a in a wheelchair, and the Fernwood Flasher, Victor Killian, who's an eighty year old, you know, he would expose himself to people and a sitcom. <laughs> I love that. But she was in that anyway. I loved I loved that show. And uh, and she actually died in June twenty second, two thousand eight, at the age of ninety three. She was also a regular on the Mary Hartman Entertainment Hour. In 1979, she had her own TV show, Mary Hartman, like a variety show, and she was a regular in that. Huh. But I love Dodie Goodman. I think she's she's a hoot. There were a ton of people that were just like blips on that. You know, Alice Ghostly, who played Esmeralda on Bewitched, we talked about her. Mm-hmm. Fanny Flagg, who was the played the nurse, who went on to write Fried Green Tomatoes, and she was another one of those people that was on like every game show in the in the 70s and the 60s. Um, there were some uh, my, Jamie Donnelly. She plays Jan, who uh, does the brush a brush a brush a thing. And I got to know her briefly. She was in the original Rocky Horror Show at the Roxy. She played. Uh, she was Jan in, on Grease on Broadway, but she was also in the LA production of the Rocky Horror Show when it came to town for the first time. And she played the the uh, the uh, the girl that sings science fiction double feature at the at the beginning of it and she goes to the same church i go to too and i was like i saw it i was i was you know looking at the people who are going to be doing the readings i saw jamie donnelly and i said no it can't be it can't be freaking jamie Don- only in la you know you're going to go to church and you see jamie donnelly go there's the chick from greece that's you know i love mm-hmm. that stuff anyway sorry i'll stop <laughs> <laughs> Dinah Manoff, who played uh, uh, Marty, she was uh, she's the daughter of Lee Grant, the actress from Valley of the Dolls. Eddie Deason, who played uh, uh, he played uh, Eugene, the nerd. You know, you're you're he is like <laughs> Pee Wee Herman. I mean, that is just straight up Pee Wee Herman with right. the white shoes and the little tie and the gla- you know. And uh, and Eddie Deason, interestingly, still around. He, he had some health scares this year. Actually, he he had open heart surgery in January. Eddie Deason um, is, is is straight, okay? I'm just saying stereotype-wise, you know, he'd be a guy, oh, that's the gay one. You know, but no, <laughs> Eddie Deason was straight, but the guy who was gay was uh, Craterface, Dennis E. Stewart. He no was kidding. the guy, yeah, he was gay, and he he died. Um, it's interesting, so, but somebody on my tour came around one time and said that, oh yeah, I used to hang out with him. Uh, he was gay. He they used to, he says we used to go to the bathhouse and cruise guys uh, together uh, at this huh. place on Fairfax. And I'm like, okay, where's that? Seven twenty five North Fairfax. It's J C. Brings an old salon. The I was upstairs say. of it was a gay bathhouse. I found the ads for it. It was called Basic <laughs> Plumbing, and it was uh, and I think the ads. Was, I swear in my life, I just found the ad. It says. Um, and this would have been Jay's office, okay? Jay Seabridge's wow. office. And the ad for it said, we've opened up the top floor for your pleasure with new private rooms and showers. So, so this is... Unbelievable. You know, I just think that it is. Isn't it? Isn't it wild? And Jay Seabridge's salon. So um, wow. anyway. What, what, what but, era well, this would have been afterwards? Well, the, right. the ad that I saw was, it was for the fifth anniversary of it, and this was in 1982. So it would have been around since 70... So it was about right, a decade afterwards, roughly, yeah. Uh, wow. Uh, yeah. So about a de- I mean, it was about a decade after the murders, the, after Sebring died. A decade after uh, Greece was made. No, it was actually at the time Greece was It was, was the made. time of Greece, but about a decade yeah. after the Tate Manson right. murders. Right, yeah. yeah. So it wasn't, I'm so, just trying to establish, there was not a gay bathhouse there likely when Sebring was... Had definitely not. There. It came along afterwards, yeah. 
Yeah, and I, I first I heard about it in a John Waters book. He wrote about this place at 725 North Fairfax. I'm like, really? And it took a long time, but I did find an ad, and that was all I found. But it's, it's oh, that's interesting. But this guy who was on my tour told me that, and that uh, uh, Eddie Deason told me that he and Dennis Stewart would carpool to Greece to the to go to the shoots for Greece because Eddie Deason would have to take the bus everywhere. Eddie Deason is Eugene. I mean, he just is Eugene. And he's just like. That is, he is the most kindest, nicest little nerd in the world. And um, am I keeping you up, Mike? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, don't mean to interrupt. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'm messing. So anyway, but Dennis, uh, Dennis uh, died in. Uh, he died in. Um, Dennis died. Uh, he had HIV and he died of pneumonia in uh, April mm. 20, 20th of 1994 at uh, at Cedar Sinai Medical Center. Wow. And I think we've touched on most everyone that uh, that I wanted to talk about. Uh, Michael Tucci, who played Sonny in the movie, I I get him confused with Stanley Tucci. I thought they were the same person for some reason. <laughs> right. You know. I, I mean, actually I had to look that up too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it's like, oh, that makes sense. They kind of look alike. Oh no, they weren't. Maybe they're related. I don't know about that, but, but right. Just uh, so. I guess as a as a postscript to this whole thing, uh, a couple of years ago, we know Olivia Newton John has uh, been battling cancer on and off for several years, and uh, and I believe she's in remission now again. But she uh, had auctioned off her jacket, her leather jacket, and her spandex pants that she had to be sewn into for uh, uh, for the movie, and they had an auction a couple of years ago benefiting you know, uh, whichever organization, the cancer organization that she chose. So the the actual pants were purchased by uh, the woman who was the founder of Spanx, <laughs> which is... No they're, kidding! They're like, yeah, they're framed like at the Spanx International Headquarters <laughs> for uh, 162000 And the, wow. the leather... Yeah. The jacket was sold for $243,000 to a fan who bought the jacket and gave it back to Olivia Newton-John, which is like, okay, that's nice. You know, what? she probably didn't give a shit. You know, it was a job that she had forty years ago. But uh, but yeah, they bought it. He bought the jacket, and she's you know she's like, oh my god, this is the greatest thing. This is so generous of you. You know, she probably was like, thank God that thing is out of my life. You know what I mean? Someone out there would appreciate it now. Now <laughs> she's got it back, back again. Back <laughs> it's like shit. Now what am I gonna do with this thing? But I hope I hope they give it to the Academy Museum when it opens up because that would be a, a really cool. That addition. would be awesome. Yeah, if Maybe it ever opens that. up. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to have some amazing stuff in that museum. I mean, they got that—they mm -hmm. got the shark from Jaws, or one of them, uh, one of the original yep. casts. Uh, I the think Ruby they got slippers. the ruby slippers. Yeah, it's uh, it's there. That's I can't wait till that museum opens up. I know it's it's always been a shock that we didn't have you know a, a top notch you know fully funded Hollywood history museum in Hollywood, mm. and it's nice to finally get one. Yeah. Know? Yeah, and I hope it doesn't end up like the Smithsonian, where you know you hear they have stuff and it's like it's put away and you never see it again. You know, I mean, it's the La like I mean, the a lot Jen of museums Clampet like that. Pete, Pete like Peterson's that. like that. They have their vault. The Peterson Museum yeah. does. Although I uh, I filmed in the Peterson Museum a couple weeks ago, and uh, I had not been in it since the remodel that they did a few years ago, and I have to say that they um, there's a lot more interior space now for for the oh, exhibits yeah. I feel like they have a lot more on display at the Peterson now than they used to and it's it's really freaking cool it's, it was an odd the Peterson Auto Museum was an odd setup you know it was shaped yes, it strangely was. on the inside so it good. wasn't set up to be a museum it was set up to be a department store I think originally oh, okay. and that was their problem so when they remodeled it they made it more like a museum space and also I remember noticing when I was there that they had like a movie cars area that was really small there were only a few cars in it and now like the entire first floor is movie cars uh, and their movie car collection is really cool I sent you a picture they have one of the they have a Batmobile in there mm -hmm. um, they have the Joker mobile they have uh, one of the original DeLoreans from Back to the Future that was used in all the movies uh, they have the they have the uh, the yellow VW bug from the Bumblebee Transformers movie is in there mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. they have the, the Tim Burton Batmobile I, they have like some really really cool they have uh, some of the futuristic cars from AI and Minority Report, I think, and some other um, just really cool stuff on display there now. So I feel like the remodel was a good thing for them. Cool. I know that they had to, uh, they sold a lot of their collection, too, to do the remodel. Um, 
So they I, they still have the Pope Mobile. That was like one of my favorites. I didn't see it when I was there. They might. I okay. don't know. They and then of course to. they they have their vault is ridiculous. Like they have Steve McQueen's Jaguar race car in the vault, which mm-hmm. is worth tens of millions. You know, it was probably a ten twenty million dollar car on its yeah. own. Oh, um, did you see that the two cars from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood are going up on the auction block? Yes, I want the Cadillac <laughs> so badly. I can't even tell you. I want that Cadillac so bad. I used to own a '76 Cadillac that was very similar to that. Really, one. just a big boat. And it was so fun to drive. And when you'd roll the windows down, there was no center post. Mm-hmm. So if you rolled the front and back windows down, it was just wide. It was almost like having a convertible with the top on. It was really wild. That's cool. It was yeah. such a cool car. And to have a car like that again and have it be the one, you know, that Brad and Leo cruised around in. Yeah. That, I, would, I, would, I would love to have that car. So I'm jealous of whoever's going to get to buy it. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that's, that is really... It's, I mean, it was used in a reservoir dogs, wasn't it? I mean, it was... A, oh, was it? Yeah, it was Michael Madsen's car. He owned it. Oh, I didn't know that. He got it at the end of the movie, and then he let Tarantino use it for this movie, and oh. now it's going on the black. That and makes it uh, even freaking cooler, man. Yeah. Now I want it even more than I already did. I know. A real chunk of Tarantino history. Because they, they had that car and the Carmen Ghia both on display outside the Arclight Cinerama Dome uh, when the movie was out. And I remember going out and seeing it there in front, right on Sunset Boulevard. Yeah, cool. That's awesome. And also, just actually, there is a, a perfect Tarantino way to wrap this thing up right now, because in okay. uh, Kill Bill, in Kill Bill, the yellow the yellow pickup truck is called the Pussy Wagon, and that's right, that's right off from Greece. And up until oh. a couple of years ago, it was in Tarantino's driveway for years. Right, and, I remember uh, seeing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and I think that well, that's. That was actually, I'm really proud of that segue. That worked out really, really well. So, uh, <laughs> so Tarantino still owns the uh, the yellow pickup truck from Kill Bill, which says Pussy Wagon, which is a direct thing to John Travolta because he was a huge John Travolta fan. Uh, in fact, I think in order to hire John Travolta for Pulp Fiction, he made him sit and play the Welcome Back Carter board game with him. To, to, that was like his audition to be in Pulp really? Fiction. <laughs> yeah, because I think Travolta had a story that he came over to Tarantino's apartment. Yeah, in yeah. like Hollywood, West Hollywood, the Fairfax District kind of general area, and I think it was, mm-hmm. I think Travolta said he had had that apartment. It That's was the cool. same apartment that Travolta had lived in years and years earlier. He knew the layout already. That's yeah. so funny. Yeah. That's cool. Wow. Well, I think that we've, uh, I think we're greased out. I think we have, uh, we've covered everything. <laughs> I think we've said grease in this podcast more times than they said it in the movie. Apparently. I think you're right. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> and but it was I fun. I, I enjoyed this. This was good. And I think a Jaws episode should definitely be the next one. Yeah, I agree. That's that. We yeah. That that'll be a fun one. And we'll see if they say Grease and Jaws at any time. They, you know what? Get the 4K and watch it. I do need before I should we do, do this. I should definitely add that to my because it's you'll hear all kinds of shit. I was like, what? <laughs> you know? Well, I just I got uh, Groundhog Day on 4K. Which is not really? one I would have thought to get in 4K, but yeah. it actually looks freaking great. It looks really yeah. good, and there's a director's commentary on it. Oh wow! It's which is really interesting. Um, yeah, so the and it might be on the Blu-ray as well. I don't know, but the 4K one has a director's commentary with Harold with Harold Ramis, and famously Harold Ramis and Bill Murray fell out and stopped being friends on mm-hmm. the set of that movie. Uh, they had a, a big, uh, they had creative differences to an extreme over how that movie should go. Bill Murray wanted it to be more of a moody movie and to kind of take more of a serious approach to some of the themes that they were exploring, whereas Ramis wanted it to be a straightforward comedy. And it got to a point where, according to Ramis's daughter, uh, she was, I think, a teenager at the time and was spent about a week on the set. And she said at one point, Her dad uncharacteristically lost his cool and physically grabbed Bill Murray and shoved him against the wall. And they stopped being friends. And, and, you know, they had been friends and and, uh, creative partners for like two decades up to that point and stopped being friends because of that movie and did not reconcile until Ramis was on his deathbed. Mm -hmm. And... um, and uh, uh, Bill Murray's brother, who's also play, who plays the mayor in Groundhog's Day, was the one that convinced Bill to go and you know patch things up with Ramis yeah. before he dies. And Bill Murray's a, an anomaly. I mean, he's he is. Mm-hmm. I can see how he would push somebody's buttons enough to to uh, make him react that way. 
But I also yeah. know so many good things about him too, because I mean, he irritates me, but I understand that, and I get where he's right. coming from, and I think Ramis probably did eventually too. I, I would say probably the best commentary on Bill Murray is that Ramis said about their falling out. According to Ramis's daughter, he described feeling variously heartbroken, confused, and yet unsurprised by the rejection when mm-hmm. Bill Murray stopped being friends with him. So I think there's right. a lot in that, that there's a lot in that description, I think, that tells mm-hmm. you a lot about the two of them. Yeah. You know? And one thing about about Murray is I don't think for one second he denied any of it. You know, he was so self aware and he's got his own, mm-hmm. you know, principles, be them, you know, right. they're his own. And he and he sticks to them. I just think that's uh He's a very well. He's very aware of, of his of his own commodity. Um, sure. And I, the stories are legendary. How he, he'll just like when he was in some Singapore and there was a wedding going on, and <laughs> and he walked up and he stuck his. Did we talk about this? Where he yeah. went, they were taking pictures and he walked up and all he said was, "You're never gonna. They'll never believe you," or something. Yeah, like that. and then it became a thing on the internet where people started kind of making up their own Bill Murray stories based on that. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Bill Murray took chips off our table and said they're never going to believe you and walked away and stuff. And oh, then okay. so it's like there got to be a blurring between what's real and what isn't. He joined yeah. a kickball game that was in progress in New York one time, apparently ran up and just kicked the ball and then kept going. Like, I love it. Like, but I know, uh, I know friends of his and they said that uh, basically uh, lost in translation is what it's like to hang out with Bill Murray because you mm-hmm. don't know where the night's going to go. And and you're going to do things that you think, are we going to get in trouble? And he's like, no, don't like, don't even worry about it. Like people love me. Don't worry. And he's right. Like he can pretty much get away with anything. You know, that's why he can walk behind a bar and start tending and nobody's going to tell him he has to leave. Mm-hmm. You know, so, um, so we went off on a Bill Murray tangent, but we uh, started off by talking about Greece. Yeah. So there it is. And heads up to everybody. Uh, just a reminder, we do have a Patreon set up. So find us on Patreon and uh, our Facebook page also, a Dearly Departed Podcast on Facebook. Uh, join and we, um, you know, the Patreon subscribers, I think the $5 subscribers get early access to the shows. And then all the subscribers, whether it's 2 or $5, get um, extra mini episodes that we do between these main ones. So, yeah. uh, and the Patreon so helps to- us keep going. If you want to, if you go to the Facebook page, the Dearly Departed Podcast Facebook page if you want to support the podcast and, and check the Patreon link there. Uh, yes. Just not to confuse it with anything else, but the Patreon link for this podcast is at our podcast page on Facebook. Yes. And um, we are, if you're out there, we're averaging, I think, somewhere between twelve and 15,000 views and downloads per episode now. For the show. That's cool. So if anybody listening is a part of an established podcast network, we are always looking for uh, to join a, a, a network, uh, an established one, you know, hopefully one of the, the, the good ones um, so that we can keep, you know, doing this even more. Because if we were to get on a network, we would do this, we would do even more episodes. So everyone yeah. wanting us to do more episodes, that's really what it takes. So if yeah. anybody out there has good connections to any of the big networks, let us know. Please, please. Reach out. Please. I would like to say that if any, and I'll, I'll say it again, uh, and forgive me because I hate it sounds preachy, but if you're on a boat, wear a life preserver, and yes. the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is there. Do a quick Google. People are there to listen. So just take care of yourselves and, uh, yep. and, uh, and surround yourselves with people that want to take care of you. Yes. And we will see you next time. Thanks. Bye.